Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we open God's word together this evening, let's take some time to make sure that we are spiritually prepared. If necessary, to recover spiritually, we need to confess our sins. The Bible is very clear that Christ paid the penalty for our sins. It is the blood of Christ that continually cleanses us, 1 John 1, 7. But then, John says that we are to confess our sins. So some people think that all you have to do is trust in Christ to cleanse your sins. That would make 1 John 1, 9 redundant. So we need to confess our sins, and that which cleanses us is the death of Christ, 1 John 1, 7. So we admit or acknowledge our sins to him, and instantly, in his grace, because of all that was done on the cross, he forgives us of those sins that we mention, and then he cleanses us from all other unrighteousness. So we'll begin with a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure that you are in right relationship with the Lord, enjoying so that you can enjoy your uh, rapport with him, your partnership with him in your spiritual life, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, you are our creator. You have created all things in heaven and the earth, all things in the, in the seas, all things in the air, all things on the earth. Father, even viruses and bacteria, all of the good and all of the bad, you created. You didn't create them bad initially, but due to the sin of Adam, this bacteria and viruses were corrupted, and now we have disease. And Father, right now, we are dealing with this disease, this pestilence, this COVID virus. Father, we pray that you would keep us healthy, that we would all be mindful of the fact that we all have a job to do to keep ourselves a distance from others, to shut down the mass, massive and quick uh, infection rate in this country that we might buy the, buy the time to discover within your creation that which will uh, heal, that which will uh, vaccinate, that which will prevent us from uh, catching this disease. Father, we know of no one in our congregation immediately, but we do know of others who are friends of friends or family, and we pray for them. We pray for opportunities to witness. We pray that we may be a light to those who need the light of the gospel in their lives. And Father, we pray that you would give us this opportunity, make us conscious and conscientious of opportunities to share the gospel, for this is a time when people will, will think about their mortality, their finitude, and what happens next. So Father, we pray for your courage. Father, we pray as we study tonight that we will continue to come to understand who you are and that you are our defense, our protector, our fortress. You are the one who surrounds us and protects us. And so, Father, we pray that we might learn to rest in you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, one announcement before I get started, and that is that this coming week, which is the week uh, before Resurrection Day, so it begins this coming, uh, this coming Monday, 
which is the 6th of April, and it extends to the 11th of April, which is uh, Saturday. So it's all mostly during the day from 9 a.m. in the morning until 7 p.m., which is when it will end. There will be a live streaming broadcast of over 40 Bible teachers taking people through the entire Gospel of John, starting on Monday morning with John chapter 1 and extending all the way to the conclusion on on uh, Saturday. So we have sent out emails. If you haven't received the email, you can send us an email. But this is put on by Discipleship Makers, Discipleship Makers Multiply, DM2. And it's a great opportunity, especially to introduce new believers to solid Bible teaching. We have notes available. We have all kinds of material is made, made available. So I encourage you that if all you have to do is some do-it-yourself projects, lay them aside, spend some time in the Word this week, and use this as a way to reach out to your neighbors. This is going to involve churches and groups and people and Bible studies all over the world they expect just an unbelievable number of people to be logging on, and so be prepared. We've sent out that information. All right, let's open our Bibles this evening to Psalm 62. We're continuing our series in relation to this, this virus that's going around to focus uh, our attention upon God as the one who protects us and provides for us, that he is our hope, he is our salvation, he is our fortress. And tonight we're going to begin to address how do we activate that? How do we make that fortress of God uh, actual in our lives? How do we make that part of our day-to-day living? So we're looking at Psalm uh, 62, talking about God, our rock, and our, our fortress. Now, in previous lessons in this series, I've looked at Psalm 61, looked at Psalm 91, Psalm um, Uh, 27. We have taken a look at some of these psalms in the context of our Tuesday night study in the life of David, Psalm 3, Psalm 64. Uh, These are are psalms that relate to David's uh, time of of great crisis when Absalom has led a conspiracy and a revolt against him. And I think that Psalm 62 and 61 could very well fit within that time frame. There is very similar uh, themes that we have here as well as, well as uh, in Psalm 3, which is definitely a historical psalm that anchors itself at that time period. But there are these other, other circumstances. For example, we saw in uh, Psalm 61 that there is a threat to the king's life in verse 6. And that at the end, there is a praise to God because God will preserve him on the basis of his covenant love, all of which can fit within within the life of David. And we've seen in Psalm 61 that David is truly crying out, screaming out. It's audible that he cries out to God, hear my cry, O Lord, pay attention uh, to my prayer. So he is crying out for God. His life is threatened. He's far from the tabernacle where God has dwelt, where he wishes to be, where he is close to God and time of worship before God. He's overwhelmed by his circumstances. He's up against a wall. He's at the end of his resources. He's desperate for deliverance, and he goes to God in prayer. And what we learned in Psalm 61 is that he reminds God that that God is a rock, and God is his rock. And we see that same theme now in Psalm 62. In verses 2 and 6, there's the emphasis on uh, being a rock, as well as in verse 7. Uh, he is a shelter. In uh, Psalm 62, 8, he is a moxa. We've seen that in some of the other psalms that we have studied, and that has to do with being a refuge, being a shelter. Sometimes it's translated a, a shelter, but it also relates to being a refuge, and the verb is often translated a refuge, but it has the meaning of being a place of trust, a reliance, taking refuge in God, trusting in him. Also, there is the reference to God being a strong uh, strong tower, a migdal. A migdal is a general term for any tower. For example, you'd go out into the, into the pastures 
uh, where you would have the sheep and there would be a tower in the middle of the pasture and this is where shepherds would uh, stand their watch where they could look out over the flock uh, at night. And then we also have the phrase that God is a fortress, Psalm 91.2, that which we studied this last Sunday, where the psalmist says, I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge, my machze, my, and my matzada, my fortress. God is our refuge. God is our, our fortress. He protects us. And then he says, my God in him, I will trust. I have my uh, confidence. There are other places in the scripture where we see references to uh, God as the fortress. For example, in Psalm 18, verses 2 and 3, we studied this some time ago in, uh, in our study of Samuel. So you could go back and look at those. I believe they're in 2 Samuel lessons 105, 106, 107, 108. And there we read, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress. So we have these, these two terms that are, we're going to study this evening. My rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. So rock and fortress both have to do with God, uh, God surrounding him. He is the protection. Rock has to do with stability and as well as defense and fortification. Deliverer focuses on being rescued from a set of circumstances. And then he goes on to say, my God, my strength. Now what's interesting here is the word rock in Psalm 18.2, which we'll study in a minute, isn't the normal word for rock, the usual word for rock. That's the word sur, the Hebrew word that's translated strength. So other translations other than the New King James have it right in most cases. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I will call upon the Lord. See, a recognition of who the Lord is as our protector, as our defender, as our source of, of salvation leads us to call upon the Lord to pray. Prayer is the way in which we activate our faith and our dependence upon God. We call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised because he is the one who intercedes and intervenes in our life. So the psalmist concludes, so shall I be saved from my enemy. So we see this progress, focus on the character of God. We see the character of God who intervenes in our life. We praise him and the result is we are delivered uh, from our trials. Psalm 31, 2 and 3, bow down your ear to me. This is, a, again, a cry like we have at the beginning of Psalm 61. Bend over, lend, your, lend me your ear, as it were. Deliver me speedily. He calls upon God to act in a hurry. <clears throat> Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. So there we have this combination of this figure of speech, a rock and refuge and be a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. These are great verses to memorize. Psalm 18, 2 and 3, Psalm 31, 2 and 3, and then Psalm 71, 2 and 3. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me. See, that's the same as bow down your ear to me or, or as we read at the beginning of Psalm 61, hear my cry, pay attention to my prayer. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. Again and again throughout the Psalms, we see this emphasis as the writer of the Psalms recognizes his serious situation. He relies upon God and his, as his rock and as his fortress. That is what we are to do. That is the pattern for us. And then Psalm 144, 1 and 2, Blessed be Yahweh my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I take refuge. He starts off, my chesed, he is dependable because God is faithful and loyal to his word and to his covenant. He's a fortress, he's a high tower, he's a deliverer, he is a shield, and he is the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. So in these verses that we've studied, we've also seen an emphasis on salvation. It's mentioned in Psalm 3, 2, and 8. 
the statement salvation belongs to the Lord. And there it is the word hashianu in the, in the Hebrew as it appears, which is the uh, word uh, to, to cry out, Lord, save me, save us. And that is what is said on, the, on Palm Sunday, the time of the entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And they cry out, Hosanna, that is the anglicized word, but it's Hosheanu. And so that is expressed in Psalm uh, 3, 2, and 8. And now in Psalm 62, 1 and 2, we also find this idea emphasized using a variant form of that word. Uh, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. And how is that related? Verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. There's a lot there in those verses that we have to understand because they're not correctly translated with the right emphasis in in, uh, the New King James Version. So (laughs) David is expressing a similar problem here in in, uh, Psalm 62 that he's expressed in Psalm 61 and also in Psalm 3 where in all of these he's under attack. There's an attack that seeks to take his life, an attack to topple him uh, from his eye office. In his particular case, it is manifested in conspiracies, in lies, in slander, in maligning him, and it is the mendacity of his enemies that has led to this horrible, horrible situation. So whenever you read through these Psalms, You need to identify the problem. What is the problem? The problem is that David is under attack verbally and physically from his enemies who seek to remove him from his office. Now, our problem is that we are under an attack from an invisible enemy in this particular situation, Uh, an invisible virus that threatens the very core of our civilization. It threatens our stability, a stable economy that we have. The economic consequences are uncertain and cause a lot of anxiety for people. It focuses on even the stability of our civilization. For many people, they fear that it will threaten the stability, the economic security of their retirement, threatening their hopes, their dreams, their very lives. But, you know, we can apply this to many different circumstances in life, wherever we feel like our life is threatened or our security is threatened, our jobs are threatened, and we may be threatened with a loss of reputation, a loss of family, a loss of stability. So David is in a situation that, like ours, is filled with uncertainty and insecurity. And what is the solution? The solution is only God. We'll get into this in the way this should be translated in verses 1 and 2. It is only God. God is the one who is sufficient. God is the one who is immovable. God is the one who is unshakable. God is the one in whom we can hide, and he is the one who defends us. And this gives us a a confident expectation, a certainty where we have our hope built on nothing less than God and his word and his promises. He is the only, only solution. And it it reminds me of what is said in the promise of God to the Israelites in the beginning of Leviticus 26. Let me remind you as we've studied, I've mentioned in Tuesday night, mentioned on Sunday morning, that at the end of Deuteronomy, we have these Uh, a, a, a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs outlining the ways God is going to bless Israel if they're obedient. And then the rest of the chapter outlines five stages of God's divine discipline, God's judgment upon Israel if they are disobedient. But in the middle, middle of uh, Leviticus 26, at the beginning part of the blessing section, in verse 8 he says, five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. Now the odds are stacked against them in terms of both numbers, a hundred to five, uh, or 10,000 to 100. The odds are stacked against them. They are out, outnumbered. They are out. In some cases with the Philistines, the Philistines had a higher technology. They had st- uh, iron for swords, whereas all the Israelites had was was bronze. And so 
uh, what God is saying here is it doesn't matter how overpowering the situation may be. The real issue is the spiritual issue. The real issue is, are you walking in obedience to me? And if you are, then I will protect you. But if you don't, then there's going to be spiritual consequences and discipline. That's why in Psalm 91.7, the writer of Psalm 91 reminds them that if they're trusting God, if they're taking shelter under his wings, then not only will they be protected from the pestilence or the plague, of course that applied directly to Israel, not to us, and he then says, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. That shows that those specific detail promises from verse 3 to verse 9 in Psalm 91 are references to the Mosaic law uh, blessings and judgments that are found in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and Deuteronomy 32. So the key issue there that is still true today, that it doesn't matter about military technology, it ultimately doesn't matter about medical technology, what matters is our trust in God and, and walking in obedience to him and not, not being foolish. And in this psalm, David recognizes that. The psalm obviously is related to a problem in David's life, but he doesn't dwell on it. He doesn't focus on it. He's not a whiner. He's not a complainer, which is what you have with a lot of people. They focus so much on the problem and not the solution that it upsets their life. It creates instability, uncertainty, fear, worry, anxiety. The issue is every time you think about the problem, you need to start thinking about God as the solution. So this psalm focuses us much more on God as the solution, more than focusing on the problem. And that's an important principle in the spiritual life. And that will fill us with confidence, with hope, with security, with stability. And you just see this lesson illustrated again and again uh, throughout the scriptures. Now, as we look at this, this psalm, there are basically three stanzas of four verses each. One through four is the first stanza, uh, 5 through 8, the second stanza, and 9 through 12, the third stanza. In these first eight verses, we see the emphasis that we must cultivate. There is a developing a stillness and a silence before God when we are in the cauldron of adversity. When we uh, look out and see that we are surrounded, we are overwhelmed, then we must cultivate this stillness and silence before God. That doesn't mean we don't act in obedience in the ways that we should. If you're actually in a military situation and you're surrounded in the military and the enemy is attacking, then you have to do what you're supposed to do in ter terms of returning fire, protecting yourself, protecting your men, and taking advantage of everything possible to attack the enemy and trusting God to bring about the victory. But in this situation... We have to understand that there is a role for being quiet before God, and that is the emphasis. This is where we get the idea of relaxing in God, resting in God. We use the term, the faith rest drill. There is an active, active part in the faith where we're believing what God has said and we're doing what God has to say in terms of making the right decisions and taking care of our families, taking care of ourselves, taking care of our health. And then on the other hand, we're resting and relaxing in God. So as we are facing this kind of a situation in the United States where we have these stay-at-home orders, it is... Uh, uh, it is our responsibility to do that and to keep the distance and do all of those different things. This is going to last a while. I hope it doesn't last far into the summer. We have no idea. But I know there, that yesterday or the day before it was announced by the governor of Virginia that he had extended their stay-at-home order until June the 10th. Uh, today I'm reading more and more things that are talking about extending this into May, uh, the middle of May, or into June. We have no idea. The main reason is because we don't have enough data. Pay attention to some of these doctors that the president is bringing forward. They're not, uh, they're not trying to upset everybody. They are not uh, exploiting the situation, but they are explaining we just don't have enough data. 
And when we don't have enough information, we tend to panic. We tend to get upset. We tend to worry. We have to relax and trust God. Don't pay attention to rumors. Don't pay attention to a lot of the news media, which just wants to uh, get everybody upset and riled up. Uh, we have to rest in God. That's what this is all about. So we start off in Psalm 62. At the beginning, we have a superscription that this is written for the chief musician, that is the choir director, the head of the music, for the worship in the, in the tabernacle, later the temple. It's written for, this could be the name of a song, uh, Jeduthun, and it is a psalm of David, so that we know exactly who wrote it. Now, the first verse reads, Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. This is what the New King James uh, has, ha how they have translated this. And so in these first four verses, uh, we see a focus upon God. This is a little bit different from what you normally see in what's called a lament psalm or a complaint psalm. Uh, the first two verses focus on confidence in God, and then verses 3 and 4 begin to express what the complaint is, what the problem is. And he is, he is confident then that he will have victory. God will give him victory and that he will uh, overcome and then in the second stanza, you have a lot of these same echoes. My soul wait silently for God alone. It, it almost it echoes the first verse. Truly, my soul silently waits, waits for God. So verses 5 through 8 echo it and put our attention in both places upon God. That he is, in verse 2, he is called the rock. He is my salvation. He is my defense. And then we look at verse 6, he only is my rock and salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge. How many times do we see the word rock there? Three times, and it's the same Hebrew word, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But what's important in this first verse is understanding what it says, which is not clear at all in the in the New King James translation. So I've put three other translations up there. I've put uh, the New American Standard Bible, that's uh, the 95 edition, the NET Bible, New English Translation, or New Electronic Edition, or what something like New English Translation, and then Alan Ross's translation. What is it that you notice in these translations? In the first verse, let me read the New King James. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. In the NASB, my soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. In the NET, for God alone I patiently wait. He is the one who delivers me. Verse uh, the Alan Ross, my soul waits in silence for God alone. My salvation comes from him. What do you see there? What is different in these other three translations that's not evident in the, in the New King James? It's the word only, alone. It emphasizes the sufficiency of God, the exclusivity of God as the protector, as the defender, as the one who delivers us. And yet in each of these are recognizing uh, what the Hebrew says. It is this word that I've highlighted on the left side, the Hebrew word ak, and this can be translated uh, truly or nevertheless, but it, in this context, it should be translated only, and it stands at the beginning of the Hebrew uh, in each of the first two verses. The emphasis is on the sufficiency of God that God is the one who's sufficient for our problems. So we have this phrase, he only, uh, in the second verse, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be uh, greatly moved. Now, when it talks, it starts off uh, talking about the only, God is the one who supplies the need. God is the one who's the defense, the protection. But I want to point out something else as we go into verse 2, and we'll come back to verse 1 in just a minute. But it is, it, must, it should be translated 
in the King James only. That should be the first word. It makes it awkward in English. But when I give my translation, we're going to start there. Only in God, my soul waits. That's the idea. How does it wait? And that's really silently waits here. The waits is in italics in your, uh, in your translation. And that means it's not there. It's silent. And so this is a, a, a word that's on the right here. It's dumia in the Hebrew. And it means silence or repose or even the idea of rest. Uh, I've got some other information there. In the other cognate languages to Hebrew, it has this idea of keeping silent or to be motionless. <coughs> the Ethiopic translates it as, as to be stupefied. What this means is that we are to completely rest. It is the, the silence here is used to talk about the silence of the dead. It is the, it, it's not the rest of the dead in terms of the others, but it is the rest that the dead have. How are they? The corpse is still. It is in repose. It is not in turmoil. And so this is the idea here. How does our soul wait? It rests in God, it is in repose, it is relaxed, it is still, it is not agitated, it is not anxious, it is not stirred up. It is going to relax in the situation and put all of the confidence in God. So literally, we should translate these first two verses as, Only for God is there silence in my soul. It is exclusively the source of our trust. We may also, this doesn't mean that we don't use medicine, medical technology in battle. It doesn't mean that we don't use military technology. But ultimately we use those under the authority of God, resting exclusively on him, that he is the one who protects us. But it's only for God is there silence in my soul. Only he is my rock and my salvation. This is the doctrine of the sufficiency of God, the sufficiency of God's grace, the sufficiency of God's power, the sufficiency of God's word, that we are resting exclusively on him, and therefore we can be still and repose and have, have rest. So the emphasis here is on that word only. Only for God does my soul silently relax or my soul silently rest? From him comes my salvation. That's how the New King James translates that. And it is the Hebrew word Yeshua. We have seen forms of that word. The verb is Yasha, which means to deliver or to save. And Yeshua is the Hebrew form of the name of Jesus. His name is Jesus in the Greek, but in Hebrew it is Yeshua, and it is related to the name Joshua, Yehoshua. Both these names derive from the same verb, meaning salvation. And so it says from him, from, it is only from the source of God that deliverance comes. And when we have this word Yeshua in the Old Testament, all of its forms, especially in Psalms, with a few possible exceptions, it often refers to physical deliverance from a problem in our life. It rarely is a synonym for justification before God in terms of eternal salvation, uh, phase one salvation, deliverance from the penalty of sin. It focuses on the fact that God intervenes in our lives to protect us and defend us from circumstances and situations. So verse 1 says it's only for God that and only in God can we rest and relax because he's the source of our deliverance. And in verse 2, only he is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. What that means is not that I'm going to be uh, moved or shaken by my circumstances, but that my faith is not going to be shaken because I have confidence in him, because my faith is in the rock of our salvation. It is the object of faith that gives us stability, not the faith itself. Faith is merely a means or channel and our focus is on God as the rock, and so he's the one who provides that, that stability. Now we have three terms here that refer to God. We have the word rock, we have the word salvation, and we have the word defense. 
because God is those three things, our faith should not falter. Our faith should not wobble. We can trust in him. And so as we look at this, we are we see that this is a figure of speech. This is a metaphor. I keep using this slide, and I hope that you don't forget it. It's the slide of a truck. Written on the top of the truck is the Greek word metaphoris, and it just means transportation. And so this is the idea. The word metaphor in the English comes out of the Greek, and it has the idea, of, of when it's applied to language, of transferring a literal meaning and transporting it to a figurative meaning, a situation that is different from the literal literal circumstances. And so we have these, these figures of speech, rock, defense, fortress, all of these different terms, a high tower, a strong tower. God is not literally a strong tower. He is not literally a fortress but he has the attributes that are distinctive to each of those things. And so it's ways of describing to us in ways we can understand that God is the one who protects us. Look at what we see in terms of that first designation that God is our rock. In Psalm 62.2, it's introduced, he only is my rock. And in Psalm 62, 6, same, same word order, so both places should be translated. Only he is my rock. Only he is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Verse 6 echoes verse 2. Verse 7, in God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Now, at the bottom of the slide, I've put the two different forms of the word for salvation. We translated salvation in both places in English. The first is Yeshua, which I talked about a minute ago, and the second is just a noun, Yesha. They both mean salvation, and in some places in the Old Testament, it is applied to that eternal deliverance from the penalty of sin, eternal salvation. But here it describes deliverance from a set of of a negative circumstances. And in, in, throughout the Old Testament, we have the same imagery of God as a rock. For example, we go back to Exodus 17, verse 6. This is a situation where um, the Israelites are, are thirsty. They're out in the desert now. They've gotten out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea, and they need water not just a little bit of water because there's about two and a half to three million Jews and you need an enormous amount of water to slake their thirst. And so there's this huge rock outcropping. It's not some small rock. It's not a boulder. It is an enormous rock outcropping. And Moses is standing before it and he, he uh, says, I will... Uh, and this is God speaking here. It says, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. So that's the promise of God to Moses. Now, this is not something that normally happens. So God tells, is telling him to obey him. It's a sign of faith and trust in God. Moses strikes the rock. Water comes out like a gushing river providing uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water for the Israelites. And he does this, and this becomes something that is referred to throughout the history of Israel and on into the New Testament. And it is the Hebrew word tzor. Now, it's important I'm bringing out the Hebrew because uh, in Psalm 18, uh, two, we see a different word used that is translated rock, and in that verse, the word sword does appear, but it's translated strength, so this is confusing, and it's important. I always get frustrated when uh, the translators of the Scripture do, are not consistent with the words. So here we have the word tzor, and in all of these verses, uh, it's all using the same Hebrew word. And this is the word in Psalm 18.2. It starts off saying, the Lord is my rock, but that's the word on the left, selah. And it does mean a rock, but it is not the most common word that is translated rock. That's the word on the right, the word I just mentioned, sur, that is translated strength in this verse. 
So we have to work our way through this. So in Psalm 17, 6, we have the introduction of this word back at the time of their deliverance. It is interpreted for us in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that this rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. There, Paul says, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him, and that rock was Christ. So it's a very clear statement that the Scripture is teaching that the rock represents Christ. The rock is Christ. And this is imp an important designation because, as we'll see as we go through Scripture, that this term rock was a title for God, it was a name of God, and God is constantly described as a rock. So when Jesus comes along and he gets into a very famous situation we've studied many times in Matthew chapter 16, that he is a asking Peter about who he is, and it comes down to a designation of the rock, Jesus is making a, a definite and precise identification of himself as God. So let's look at that. If you want to, you can turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and we see this remarkable scenario where the Lord Jesus Christ is getting the disciples to focus on who he is. And it's one of only two passages in, in the gospel of Matthew, where it uses the word church, and it's the only place where it refers to the future church that Christ will build, that he's building now in the church age. So, Matthew 16, 13 says that when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea uh, Philippi, this is in the northern part of Israel, I'll show you a map in just a minute, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they respond, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, some people Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, the, it's important to note that question that Jesus is asking. He's taking a term that comes out of Daniel 7. We've studied this many times. The term Son of Man. It emphasizes that this person is human, but it is applied to a heavenly person in Daniel 7 who comes before the throne of the Ancient of Days and seeks to be given the kingdom. Kingdom is an important concept throughout Matthew. And so this is talking about the one who is the future king who will bring the kingdom to Israel. So Jesus is talking about that. Who am I the son of man? Who do people say that I the son of man am? He's trying to get the disciples to connect the dots here. So we look at this map. This is in the northern part of Israel. This body of water here is the Sea of Gal Galilee or Lake uh, Gennesaret. And this is where they have been at where this red dot is located. Here's Capernaum. The green dot is Bethsaida, and so they're in the northern part there, near Bethsaida, and they move north to Caesarea Philippi, which is, if you can see the ridge lines just here, this is where Mount Hermon is, which is the highest elevation in the northern part of Israel. And so they go up there to this area of Caesarea Philippi, which is a Gentile town, and Jesus asked this question. Now, it's very important to understand the geography of this area. And so he asked them this question, and um, after the other disciples make their guesses and tell, people, or ex tell Jesus of the guesses of, of the people, then Jesus turns and said, but who do you say that I am? Not what the people are saying, but who do you say that I am? Do you, have you figured out who I am yet? And Simon Peter answers and says, you are the Christos, which is the translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach, the son of the living God. So we have, first of all, the phrase, who am I the son of man? And then Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That phrase, son of the living God, indicates that he is fully God. He's also identified himself as a human. But Peter says the Messiah 
is the son of the living God. He understands who the Messiah is from many Old Testament passages that indicated the deity of the Messiah. And so Jesus responds by saying to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's revealed not, not directly, I don't think. It's not like God said, okay, Peter, I'm giving you the answer to the test question. It's in the Word of God. It's been revealed by God again and again and again through the Old Testament, and that's how it's been revealed to Peter. Now, he goes, Peter goes on to say, or, or Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, this is important to understand the, the, the physical location. So we have this picture here of what it looked like when Jesus was there with his disciples. We see that there's this e enormous rock outcropping. At the base of it, there are these temples that are built. And this is where the Greek god Pan was worshipped. And Pan is a guardian of Hades. And what we see in this left, uh, this le temple on the left, there's a dark spot behind it, and that represents an entrance to a cave. Now, this is what it looks like today. This is the cave over here on the left. So they had a temple over here, and this was thought to be the entrance to Hades, the entrance to Sheol. And the Greek god Pan is the uh, one who, who guards it. And they have a sign there that talks about this cave, which is this, had the sacred sanctuary, and it was the abode of this shepherd god Pan. And it's called also today, it's called in Arabic, Banyas, because Arabs can't pronounce the letter P. So... If you want to push it, that's why there's no such thing as a Palestinian, because they can't say it. Uh, when they say it, they call it a Palestinian. But, so you can have a little fun with that. But here's the entrance to Sheol. And it's always fun when we go there to try to charge the gates of hell and all these other fun things that we do. But this is the background. And Jesus, when he talks to Peter, he's using his proper name Petros, which is a name for a small rock or a broken off piece of rock. And he says, you're Peter, you're just a small rock, but on this rock, and he uses a different word, he uses a different form of the word, he uses the word Petra, which indicates a large rock. But you get a lot of interpretations as to what this word rock refers to. Is he talking about the rock of the statement that Peter has made? Is he talking about the faith of Peter? Is he talking about Peter himself? And what, what makes most sense when you study the scripture is that throughout the Old Testament, God is called a rock. And when Peter has said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, he has identified Jesus with God. You are God. You are fully God. And so when Jesus says, you got this right, it's on this rock, this statement that I am the rock, that is what I will build my church on, is understanding who I am as the rock. And there's other passages, even in Psalm 118, referring to Jesus as the cornerstone that the builders rejected. This, all, this whole imagery of Jesus as the rock and that God is the rock uh, comes all the way through Scripture. This is why we can have confidence in our salvation this is why we can have confidence that God protects us, even if he doesn't save us through the situation or from the situation and takes us to be with him, what glory that will be. We will be face to face with the Lord where there's no more pain, sorrow, tears, all of that is passed away, and we will be in glorious happiness in the presence of the Lord. So we should not fear anything like the, the three friends of Daniel who were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They said, God can save us, but even if he doesn't, he will take us to be with him. We're going to trust him no matter what happens. 
Now, in this episode, uh, Christ says, I will build future tents. I will build my church on this rock, on the reality that I am God. I am fully divine, and therefore I am able to fulfill all of the predictions and promises and prophecies in the Old Testament. Jesus says two things. He says, I will build my church. And in verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Only God can do that. A man cannot do that. Only one who is both God and man who is the Savior can do that. His statements clearly are uh, clearly emphasize that he is God because he's able to do what only God, God can do. The, ter- the idea of a rock as a foundation is also part of a parable in Matthew 7, 24, where Jesus concludes the parable by saying, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, that is the word of God, that which is revealed to us and we have in the Gospels, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, Why is it emphasizing doing them? All through Scripture it says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. This is expressing our love for him. So it doesn't have to do with salvation phase one. This is living the Christian life, the uh, salvation phase two. Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. That's building our lives on the rock of our salvation. So back to Psalms. Psalm 18, 31 states, For who is God except Yahweh? And who is a rock except our God? So God is the rock. Psalm 18, 46, Yahweh lives. He's the living God. That's why Peter says he, Christ is the son of the living God. He's going back to these, this language like we have in Psalm 1846. Blessed be my rock. So David is calling God the rock. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Psalm 78, 35. This is talking about the Exodus generation at the time of, of uh, Moses striking the rock, then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. So rock is related by parallelism to the redeemer because he is our rock. He can redeem us. Deuteronomy 32, 30 and 31. Uh, uh, again, Here Moses uses that same imagery of of God's blessing where one man can put to flight a a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. He says, how could they do this unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For their rock is that, referring to their enemies, their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Psalm 91, 7, which we studied on Sunday morning, picks up on this imagery and reminds them that if they take shelter under the almighty wings, the almighty shadow of God, then God will give them victory militarily. And also in these passages talks about he will not visit them with the diseases of Egypt, the plagues of Egypt. 2 Samuel twenty two forty seven. As nearing the close of David's life, he says, Yahweh lives, blessed be my rock, let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. So all of this is behind this statement of Psalm 62 too. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. In Psalm 18 too, these same terms are related to God as our fortress and our deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So two words I want to bring out here. The first word is the word for fortress, Matsuda, which is where we get the name for Masada, the fortress that is down near the Dead Sea. And then the word, my salvation, Yeshua, or deliverance. We're delivered by the God who is our fortress. Psalm 91.2 uses similar language. I will say of Yahweh, he's my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will seek refuge. In him I will trust is, is the significance of, of that, that particular phrase. This is related, uh, the word uh, fortress, a refuge rather, 
related to Psalm 61.3, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Now I want you to understand why I keep going over all these verses. I want you to understand how these these topics, this language is repeated again and again all through the Psalms. God wants us to understand by all this repetition that he is the one who protects us. But how do we activate that in our lives? How do we make that real in terms of our experience? And years ago I developed this under the concept of a soul fortress, a fortification for our soul. And what I'm going to have to only have time for tonight is to kind of go through a very quick overview, and then the next time we come back, which will not be Sunday morning, I don't want to do this Sunday, it may, I may wait another week, because this coming Sunday we, we start focusing on uh, what happened during the last week of Jesus' life before he uh, goes to the cross and then he is resurrected the next Sunday. So I want to focus on those things. So we may wait until after this next week is over before we come back and, and work our way through this whole section of the Soul Fortress. But I want to summarize it for you. I know there's, uh, last time I taught, th taught this, last time I used this particular slideshow, which I've improved on a little bit, uh, was it 12, 15 years ago. Um, and we have a lot of people who weren't here then, a lot of people who haven't heard that or gone through this. And we all need to be reminded, as Peter has told us in our study of Second Peter on Thursday nights, that Peter has emphasized the importance of repetition, the importance of reminding everybody of these things. So we'll do a quick overview on the Soul Fortress now and then work our way through it when we come back in the next lesson. What is it? This is the question. What is it that protects your soul in times of testing? For all of this is a test. It's an opportunity for us to either trust in God and relax and rest in Him, or an opportunity to just be seized up by the horrors of the circumstances and live in emotional instability. We have to focus in the Lord. So what is it that protects us? And that is the soul fortress. When we are resting in God as, the, as our fortress and as our refuge, we do that by, by fulfilling or by implementing these spiritual skills. They are things we must practice over and over and over again. They are skills that we develop, that we hone, that we sharpen. We, we never become real experts at it because we have the problem of our sin nature. But we need to focus on these things. And the soul fortress protects our soul from the attacks of sin, the enemy within, from the cosmic system, the world system that constantly pressures us to conform to the way the world thinks, the, what the world wants us to do, and uh, the devil who seeks to, to distract us from obeying the Lord. So the foundation for the spiritual life in the church age, this way the diagram works, the, 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 what, what everything is built on is our walk by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the key to our spiritual life. Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit, and you will not bring to completion the lust of the flesh. So that's the foundation of the fortress. But notice the fortress here is empty. How do we get inside the fortress? We get inside the fortress through the drawbridge. And in the animation, the drawbridge has gone down, and the drawbridge is labeled confess. We move into the soul fortress. We realize God and implement God's protection over us as we first confess sin so that we are restored to a position where we're walking with the Lord, walking in dependence on God the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, instantly our soul goes into the soul fortress. We begin to uh, realize in our experience how God is protecting us. And so over time, as we grow and mature as believers, what happens is we see this soul fortress develop through the implementation and 
uh, of the spiritual skills and as we perfect or mature our use of those spiritual skills. So it starts, first of all, with confession of sin. That's the first spiritual skill, uh, learning to keep short accounts. And then we have the filling of the Spirit. The third spiritual skill is the faith rest drill. This is what we've been studying again and again as we see it manifested in the life of David through all of these different psalms that we have been studying. It is a trust in God, a confidence in God, hope in God that allows us to be quiet, still, relaxed, calm in the midst of horrendous circumstances. The fourth spiritual skill is understanding and implementing grace. Grace orientation means to align our thinking with grace, that we are to treat other people in love. Uh, Grace orientation has a lot of facets to it. The foundation of grace orientation is really humility. You can't be grace-oriented when you're arrogant. We have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God first and foremost. This recognizes that it's God's power, not our power. It's God's promises, not our ability. It is God's omnipotence, not our capabilities or skill. And so we rest in Him. It involves humility. It involves teachability. We have to be taught by God, we have to rest in Him and let our our thinking be transformed and renewed by the study of God's Word. That calls on our part for regular discipline in making Bible reading, Bible study, listening to the instruction of God's Word, being reminded of God's faithfulness over and over again. Then as we build that, along with grace orientation, we develop doctrinal orientation. That means we orient our thinking, our values, our way of life to what God has taught us. And so we, as, as God's teaching through his word begins to transform us, then we learn to implement the faith rest drill in more advanced ways as we're grabbing hold of those promises of God and utilizing them in our day-to-day life. This is, uh, prior to this, uh uh-oh, I'm going to run through this real quick and reestablish that. What we have here is that when we get to this stage, this is all what characteristic of spiritual infancy to spiritual adolescence. These are foundational to the more advanced spiritual skills. First, we have to master these, confession, faith rest drill, grace orientation, doctrinal orientation, everything else builds on that as the foundation. And so the next stage is we come to understand that God has a plan for us and we have an eternal destiny. So we develop a personal sense of our eternal destiny where we are living today in light of eternity. Then on top of this, grace orientation is humility and it's the foundation for love, we expand our love for God. This doesn't mean that we haven't had a form of love for God, an immature love for God, but now it is going to mature. Even a three-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old child understands something about loving the parents. But then when he matures, that love is transformed and becomes much more rich and much more significant in the life. And so that's what happens in maturity. Our personal love for God is enriched and strengthened, and uh, it leads to a consistent obedience to God. Part of that is an expansion of grace orientation in terms of an impersonal love for others. By impersonal, I mean that we, it doesn't involve a personal knowledge of the other person. We encounter people all the time, all day long, that we don't know. It may be somebody who we're talking to on customer service. It may be somebody at the grocery store. It may be somebody that we have an appointment with, and we are to treat them in love and kindness and, and goodness, not because they deserve it, but because Christ died on the cross for our sins. And so we have an impersonal love for all mankind, and that leads then to an occupation with Christ. 
We ask that, I, I hate the fact that it's been trivialized today with these little wristbands and sayings on t-shirts and other things like that, but the question is, how would Jesus respond here? But everybody asks this question, but they can't answer it if you don't know who Jesus is. If you don't have a, a great understanding of who Jesus the Messiah is, then you can't accurately answer that question. A lot of young Christians just have their own imagination, and out of their imagination, nation, they create an understanding of Jesus that's not biblical at all, it's just their emotion, and they talk about, oh, how they love Jesus. Well, they don't know who Jesus is yet. They haven't been saved enough. They don't know the Word of God long enough. They don't have a clear biblical understanding of who Jesus is. So we have to know who Jesus is before we can really be focused on him, and that is occupation with Christ. And then that leads to uh, inner happiness to real joy. We have joy before, but this is when it dominates our thinking and it we have this kind of rich stability, tranquility, and contentment even in the most uh, wicked of circumstances like that of Daniel as he's threatened with his very death if he prays or asks uh, God for anything instead of asking, uh, asking the Persian king and he nevertheless goes home as he did every single day and he prays to God knowing that they would throw him into a den of lions for doing that. But he's calm, he's relaxed, he doesn't lose his temper, he just does what he's supposed to do. He has great joy and contentment to face that, that circumstances. So that's the quick rundown on how to activate the soul fortress, where we are realizing, as David did, that God is our rock, he's our high tower, he is our defense, he is our fortification. And so we will come back next time, the next lesson in this series, and work our way through each one of these, understanding their significance for our spiritual life. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and be reminded of your grace, your goodness, your protection. We don't deserve any of it, yet for Christ's sake, because we are righteous in him by virtue of imputation of his righteousness and by our position in him, you do all of these things for us. You are so good to us, and you will watch over us and provide for us and strengthen us, and that no matter what may befall us in these current circumstances, we will have a calm and a peace and we will focus on eternal things and not temporal things and trust in you above all things. Father, strengthen us, strengthen our faith, and may we have a consistent and tremendous witness to those around us. In Christ's name, amen.